Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Helen Hayes and Otto Kruger in To the Ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Special greeting tonight to the ladies. And even more especially to one lady. The first lady of the American theater, Miss Helen Hayes. Upon her dainty shoulders, she wears the mantle of dramatic greatness. And in her slim hands, she holds the key to all our hearts. We asked her to do the play to the ladies because it was one of her biggest Broadway hits. When she arrived at our stage door for the first rehearsal, we had Otto Kruger here to greet her. Otto was a leading man in the New York production, and he plays his original role tonight. To the Ladies is a romantic comedy written by two of the country's favorite playwrights, George S. Kaufman and Mark Connolly. Perhaps I should say it's a realistic comedy, because the two men who wrote it have proved to all men that this is a woman's world. Naturally, we dedicate our play to the ladies, and it's brought to you by Lux Flakes, a product that's dedicated to the ladies. Lux Flakes works from sun to sun to see that woman's work gets done. And now for an advanced course in romance and diplomacy, we raise the curtain on Act One of To the Ladies, starring Helen Hayes as Elsie and Otto Kruger as Leonard. Punctuality plus neatness plus honest endeavor equals success. This is the golden rule of the Kincaid Piano Company, the keynote, we might say, of its prosperity. It's 9 a.m. on the dot. A hundred minor clerks arriving in the nick of time with bright and shining faces go quickly to their desks, dust off their mottos, and begin the day's routine. But now in the midst of all this honest endeavor comes a shrill voice. A blaze has broken out in the filing room. In an instant, the well-organized force has formed a paper cup brigade at the water cooler. The fire engines are summoned, and the conflagration is quickly reduced to a small pile of ashes. Okay, boys, that's enough. Chief, Chief, is everything all right? All under control, Mr. Kincaid. Fine, fine. That's nice work, Chief. Clear that hose out, boys. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the excitement is over and the fire is out. Before going back to our desks to continue with the day's work... I should like to know which one of you called the fire department. Mr. Kincaid? Yes? I think, I think it was Mr. Beebe. Mr. Beebe? Mr. Beebe, where are you? Here. I'm, I'm right here. Mr. Beebe, is this true? Did you take it upon yourself to summon the fire engines? Well, yes, sir, I did. You see, I was afraid... That's that enough. Summoned... Ladies and gentlemen, you've often heard me speak of initiative. You have just witnessed a splendid example of it in the quick-witted ex action of Mr. Leonard Beebe. Mr. Beebe, my congratulations. Oh. Oh, thank you. Mr. Beebe, I should like to see you in my office, please, at 10, uh, 25. Yes, sir. I'll be there. Yes, sir. Well, go on, Leonard. What did he say then? Well, then he said... Mr. Beebe, you're married, of course. And I said, yes, Mr. Kincaid, I'm married to the sweetest little woman in the world. Oh, Leonard, go on, dear. Well, then he said, uh, Beebe, the missus and I are driving down to the country Saturday afternoon, and perhaps we'll drop off and say hello to you at your place. They're coming here? Yeah, Saturday afternoon, 3 o'clock. Oh, Leonard, that's wonderful. You know what that means, don't you? I'll be chief clerk inside of a month. Oh, now, Leonard, you don't know that you will at all. Well, I know the job's vacant, don't I? And then that's, that's the way it always begins. First, he and Mrs. Kincaid pay you a visit, and then, and then you get invited at the annual banquet, and then, and then you get promoted. Oh, Leonard, I hope so. <laughs> But we mustn't, we mustn't count on it now. Well, why not? Don't you think I can handle a job? Oh, of course, darling. All you need is, is... A chance. Yes, certainly. Yeah, if, if I'm the right man, I'll make my own chance. You, you remember that piece in the magazine last month? Oh. Where will you be ten years from now? Are you taking advantage of your opportunity? You know, I read it to you. That one. Well, anyway, when he sent for me and he said all those nice things, well, uh, that's where I got my work in. You see, I told him we had a Kincaid piano and that you played it all the time. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, Leonard, I can't get over how smart you are. <laughs> uh, are you sure you did it just the way I suggested about telling him? Yeah. That the... uh, huh? 
Oh, you you hardly gave me no more than the germ oh. of it. Uh, you only said if I ever did get a chance to speak to Mr. Kincaid... I Kincaid's know, about... Leonard. I know it was Whoa. you. Oh, you've got to take care of me, Leonard. Oh, I will, all right. I'll, I'll make a lot of money, too. You just watch me. I know you will. You know, Leonard, I believe in you. I know what a brilliant mind you've got, and I know what you can do. Well, he's coming out sure to invite me to the banquet. Now, you just watch. Leonard. What? I was just thinking, we must owe an awful lot of money. Well, uh, no, not an awful lot. We owe us some. Did you ever pay off the money we borrowed on the piano? Huh? What, the piano? Oh, I, no, no, not quite. I... You're not behind on it, are no, you? No, no, just about a week. Oh, Leonard. Well, I'm, I'll take care of it Monday. Oh, Leonard. It's all that terrible grapefruit farm. Oh. That's what you're always needing money for. If only you hadn't bought it. Not bought the grapefruit farm. I'll bet you when it's bringing us in $350 a week, you won't say that. But way off in Florida. And how do you know it will bring in anything? Haven't they always? I showed you what it said about it in the magazine. Keep a grapefruit farm for four years and it will keep you for life. Well, we, we've had it for two years already. Oh, it did take an awful lot of money, though. And we need so many things. Oh, Elsie, please don't worry about it. Now, someday, I'm going to give you everything you want. And I've got a feeling that that someday starts this Saturday afternoon. Leonard, is that you? Yeah, it's me. Hurry up, darling. They'll be here any minute. All right, look. Here, here are the cigars. I bought three, just as you said. Hey, 40 cents a piece. Ooh, they're terribly expensive, aren't they? Say, you know, Elsie, I, I think you're wrong about not giving them something to eat. Yeah, they, 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 they judge us by what we do. But not by a lot of food. No, Leonard. Well, all right, then. Well, listen, well, what about that bottle of champagne, then? The Christmas present from Uncle Fred? Well, what's the difference? We never get a better chance to use it. Well, I'll put it on ice. Where is it? In the hall closet on the top shelf. You'll have to use a chair. Yeah. Be careful, Leonard. I will. Say, uh, you know those cigars? They're genuine floor de bass. They're the same kind of millionaire smoke, you know. There was a long piece about famous men and their cigars last Sunday. Did you read it in the World Magazine? No, Leonard. Leonard? Huh? They're here. Oh, all right. All right, don't, 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 don't get excited. Now, take it easy. Here, put this on the ice, will you? Open the door, dear. All right, all right. Now, easy does it. R -r Relax. <sighs> Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, hello, Chester. Well, hiya, Leonard. What's the matter? Oh, I thought you were... Well, never mind. Hello, Elsie. How are you? Well, I'm fine, Chester. Leonard, push that chair back where it belongs. Well, cleaning up for the great visit, eh? Do you know about it? Oh, sure. Oh. Everybody in the office knew it when I left. Said the boss had his eye on Len and was coming out to invite him to the annual banquet. Funny how things get around. Yes, ain't it, though? Say, Elsie, uh, don't you think you'd better put uh, that on ice? I'm going now, dear. Ah, something to drink? Yes, Chester. Well, fine. Done. Well, Leonard, I guess you're doing all right, eh? You mean with the boss? Yeah. Say, how did you ever get him to come out here? Well, I'll, I'll tell you if you don't let him... Let it go any further. Uh -huh. It was just a, a bit of uh, psychology with me. Yeah? Yeah, you know how he feels about all his employees having pianos. <laughs> Don't I look at the sign all day long? A Kincaid piano is the heart of the home. Yeah, well, I, I told him we had one. Say, that was pretty smart. Sure, I just sized them up, that's all. Character reading. You remember that ad I showed you? If a man has a long nose and a high forehead and... Uh, where's that magazine? I'll show you what I mean. Hey, is this the one? Hey, I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Ah, glasses, eh, Elsie? Yes, Chester, four of them. We're expecting Mr. Inc Mrs. Kincaid, Chester. I know, right I know. Right away. Well, uh, here's that character reading ad, Leonard. Where? Hey, all right oh, here. Oh, Leonard, I wish you wouldn't pay so much attention to those advertisements. Oh, is that so? Well, that's where I learned about the grapefruit farm. Yes, I know. Well, uh, a lot of fellows have got good tips out of here. Look, here, look, look at this. Babson of Iowa made $600 the first month. That's that popcorn machine, you know, sure. Chuck. Chris Betts, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, McCormick of Michigan made $550. What McCormick? Huh? What McCormick? What? Uh, Michigan. What's his first name? What, what's the difference what his first name is if he made all the money? But did he make it? Well, of course he made. Doesn't it say so right here? Oh, and right. I suppose you think thousands of fellows don't make a lot of money out of these correspondence courses, too. Lena, don't you know that... That those things are for the people who, who haven't got it in them, who have to acquire it from the outside. 
Now, you're different. You have the ability. It, it's, it's just a case of giving it a chance to come out. Yeah, well, you may be right, but uh, I don't know. It, it seems a shame to let all that easy money slip away, that's all. The, uh, is, say, say, here's a book I'd like. 500 speeches for all occasions. Listen. Suppose in a gathering of distinguished and brilliant men and women, the host of the occasion suddenly calls upon you to make a speech. Would you stammer and sit down, or would you electrify one and all by your eloquence, fairly swinging them off their feet by the magic of your words? Watson's manual of speech-making shows you how 500 sample addresses clip the coop today. A friend of mine has one. They're good. Yeah. Send $3 for 30 days trial. Your money refunded if... Gee, that, you know, it would be kind of nice to have one of those things. Oh, huh? but Leonard, you, you're never called on to make a speech. I know. It's only $3, oh, though. Oh, Leonard. Got... Elsie. They're here. Mr. and Mrs. Kincaid. All right, darling. I'll let them in. Chester, do you mind? Me? Mind what? Chester, don't you see? Oh, you mean you want me to go? Oh, sure. <laughs> Thank you, Chester. You can go out by the kitchen. Okay, so long, Len. Good luck. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Oh, Mrs. Kincaid, I'm Mrs. Beebe. How do you do? Come in, please. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? How do you do, Mr. Kincaid? Hello, Beebe. How are you? My wife, Mr. Beebe. How do you do? How do you do? Uh... Uh, sit down, Mrs. Kincaid. Oh, let me take your wrap, Mrs. Kincaid. Oh, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> sure. Well, how's business? Oh, fair, fair. <laughs> That's too bad. Huh? Oh. I mean, no, no, it's, it's too bad. I mean, it isn't better than fair. <laughs> well, Leonard, Leonard, perhaps Mr. Kincaid would like a cigar? I'm a cigar? Oh, yes. Uh, cigar, Mr. Kincaid? No, thank you. Huh? Giving it up for the present, doctor's orders. Oh, oh, I see. Well, this... oh. <laughs> well, how, how about a little champagne? Champagne? Well. Fine, fine. I got it on ice. I'll be right back, Mr. Kincaid. You're from the South, aren't you, Mrs. Beebe? <laughs> yes, I am. Mobile. Uh, Mobile, is that so? I wonder if you know the Foresters in Mobile, Selena Forrester. Indeed, I do. She's charming, don't you think? Yes, I always enjoy the being. Oh, oh. Oh, dear. Oh, Leonard seems to be having a little difficulty. Yes. Is everything all right, Leonard? Sure. Sure, fine. The bottle was just slippery. Oh. oh, here it is. I, I, I'll pour it, dear. Oh. Ah. Mmm, very fine champagne, B.B. Yes. Uh, we must lay in some more of this, dear. Uh, Elsie, our stock is rather low. Oh, Leonard's such a joker. You'll have to wait for Uncle Fred to send us more, Leonard. He gave it to us for Christmas, Mr. Kincaid. Well, it's certainly very kind of you. <laughs> Sorry, we're having something better. Um, well, uh, to the ladies. To the ladies. <sighs> well, guess you don't get much of this anymore. I, I mean, except at uh, banquets and dinners and places. Uh, Elsie, well, wouldn't you like to uh, play something for Mr. Kincaid oh, on the piano? Leonard, I don't think... Oh, please do. Well, if you really want me to. Yes, indeed. We've been looking forward to it. <laughs> Leonard really overestimates my playing. It's pretty average. I uh, noticed you had one of our pianos. Oh, yeah. Give satisfaction, does it? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, indeed. We couldn't afford to have one that had to be tuned all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's the one, Elsie. Yeah, I like that one. Wait, 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 wait till you hear this, Mr. Kincaid. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Yeah. Leonard, will you go? What? Oh, of course. Oh, excuse me. What? What is it? Are you LHBB? Yes. Okay, we're here for the piano. What? We're here for the piano. Get them rollers, Jim. Okay. Oh, oh, oh no, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait, this is going to all be fixed up, I think. Yeah? How? Oh, would, would you please come inside with me a minute? I'm... I'm... <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Kincaid. This way, please. Well, Tom, I haven't seen you in a long time. Well, Mrs. Kincaid, do you mind? I'll, I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Why, of course. Well. It's too bad, isn't it? You, Truckman. You speaking to me? I am. Spill it. What is the name of your company? McAvoy Express. I don't mean that. You were sent here by a loan company, I imagine. You imagine is good. How much does Mr. Beebe owe you? He don't owe us anything. He owes the loan company uh, 22 bucks. Well... Here you are. Please give Mr. Beebe a receipt. Sure. It's worth that to find out these things. And yet I'm sorry somehow. Mr. Kincaid, I'm afraid there's been a little misunderstanding. I believe it's straightened out now. The truckman will give you a receipt for $22, Mrs. Beebe. Mr. Kincaid, you didn't... I took the liberty, yes. You ready, Myrtle? 
You're not going. I'm afraid that we must. Oh, wait, please, Mr. Kincaid. I know you think that Leonard's been extravagant, but he hasn't. I mean, you think he's been spending money foolishly. I'll admit I'm a little prejudiced. I don't like to see any of our young men in debt. He should think of his family, his future. Oh, but he has, Mr. Kincaid. That's just what he has been thinking about. He's been making an investment. Really? Buying a farm. Oh, is that so? A grapefruit farm in Florida. Oh. He's been saving every penny he could just to pay off what we owed on it. And then just a few days ago, he had a chance to pay off all the balance at a big reduction that the, the company made him an offer to, and, and so we borrowed $400 on the piano. But he did it to buy the farm with, and after all that saving, isn't it? Mrs. Beebe, there's no reason why you should feel called upon to explain to oh, me. Oh, but there is. Listen. Oh, golly, if I could only make you understand. But, of course, you've never been poor, either of you. Mrs. Kincaid, do you understand? Well, I... I mean, I mean really poor. So that a few dollars actually mattered, and, and you had to be awfully careful what you did with them. So that you had to plan weeks ahead so much for each little thing, and... Then if something came up that you hadn't counted on and that just had to be paid, well, that meant that you had to do without something that you almost had to have to live. Well, you see, we've done that ever since we're married. Well, we don't mind being poor, you know, but then when it looks as if you've almost helped each other out of it and the chance comes, well, I could only make you understand. <laughs> don't worry, my dear. It'll be all right. Well, folks, I'm, I'm sorry about the interruption. Never mind, baby. You ready, Myrtle? Yes. Oh, John, I forgot my bag. You... What? I said, I forgot my bag. Oh, yes, dear. Here it is, Mrs. Kincaid. Thank you. Well, John? Yes, dear, in a minute. <clears throat> oh, uh, Beebe. Yes, sir? I forgot to mention that we'll expect you at the annual banquet of the personnel on the 18th. We, uh, we like to have one or two of you younger fellows present, you know. Why, but... why, yes, well... That's I'm... fine. I intended mentioning it earlier, but, uh, I forgot... Now, we want you to come, too, Mrs. Beebe. Oh, thank you. I'd be delighted. And by the way, Beebe, you'll be expected to say a few words. Just anything that strikes you. Oh, uh, sh sure. What'll I speak about? Oh, anything at all. Of a business nature. Well, good day, Mrs. Beebe. Good day. Good day, Mrs. Kincaid. Goodbye, my dear. I hope we can meet again sometime. I hope so. Goodbye, Mr. Beebe. Goodbye. Go uh, good day. Good day. Good... Leonard! You got it! Yeah, what, 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 what happened? Well, you heard. Oh, Leonard. I know, but the piano... We've... <laughs> Mr. Kincaid paid it. He did. Oh, Leonard, do you realize what happened? You're going to the banquet. Yeah. Well, well, sure. I told you it was coming, didn't I? Leonard. Huh? You've got to make a speech. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. I know. I know. The book, that 500 speeches for all occasions. Oh, Leonard, do you think you're going to need that? You bet your life. Here's the coupon. Give me a pencil, quick. Oh, here, here, dear. Kindly send manual of speech making. Signed, Leonard Beebe. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille brings us Act Two of To the Ladies, starring Helen Hayes and Otto Kruger. During this short intermission, we're going to bring you a study in contrasts, the story of two girls... Here's popular Polly. She's dainty and jolly, as bright and as gay as a lark. Her phone's always ringing, her date book is brimming, and she's singing from dawn until dark. It's a happy, happy day. Do, 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 do. But poor little Lou is gloomy and blue. She sits and she watches the clock. Life's passing her by. And she doesn't know why she's the loneliest girl on the block. Alone, I'm so alone. Now there you have two girls, equally pretty, yet one is popular, the other left out of things. Why do things like that happen sometimes? Maybe we can answer that best by looking at popular Polly for a moment. From the crown of her head to the tip of her toes, she's neat as a pin and as sweet as a rose. That's one great secret of popularity, Mr. Ruick, a lovely flower-like daintiness. 
If a girl is even the least bit careless about the things she wears, she may offend people. That's why the truly dainty girl luxes under things after every wearing, blouses, dresses, and accessories, often to remove every trace of perspiration. New Quick Lux is so easy to use. It certainly is. Why millions of women are enthusiastic about New Quick Lux? For one thing, it's so fast. In water as cool as your hand, it dissolves three times as fast as any of ten other leading soaps tested. You'll find it goes further, too. Gives more suds, ounce for ounce, even in hard water, than these other soaps. And, of course, New Quick Lux is safe for everything, safe in water alone. Yet it costs you no more. Get the generous large box of New Quick Lux Flakes tomorrow in the same familiar package. Use it for your stockings, underthings, and your pretty summer dresses. To avoid offending, to help your things stay new-looking longer. And now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of To the Ladies, starring Helen Hayes as Elsie and Otto Kruger as Leonard. The night of the great banquet approaches rapidly. In the office, Leonard works at fever pitch, the chief clerkship almost within his grasp. But now a cloud appears on the sunny horizon in the person of one Thomas Wood Baker, a young ambitious fellow worker. Mr. Baker wears a supercilious smile as he stops one morning at Leonard's desk. Good morning. Oh, hello, Baker. I just wanted to congratulate you, Beebe. I hear you're going to the banquet Wednesday night. <laughs> That's right. Thanks a lot, Baker. Well, I'll be seeing you there, I guess. You, you what? Sure, the boss invited me, too. Oh, I see. You, uh, going to make a speech? Yeah, I, I am. So am I. Oh. Well, <laughs> may the best man win, eh, Beebe? Yeah. So long. Uh, see you Wednesday. Yeah, see you Wednesday. Honored President, Mr. Toastmaster, ladies and gentlemen, I am feeling at this moment exactly like the seasick passenger on the ocean liner Leonard, who... what are you doing? I'm practicing my speech. Don't you think you ought to be getting dressed, dear? Yeah, in a minute. Uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I, am, I am feeling at this minute exactly like the seasick passenger on the ocean liner who was asked by a fellow passenger who was amused by his illness, are you afraid you are going to die? No, said the sick man, I'm afraid I'm not going to. As an orator, I am non-est. However, I... Here's your shirt, dear. I put the studs in for you and your suit's laid out on the bed. All right, thanks, darling. That'll give me more time to rehearse the speech. And I... You're not putting anything more in it, are you, dear? Huh? I mean, I mean, it sounded just the right length to me. You still don't like it, do you? Well, I think it's wonderful for what it is, but I still believe you could have written a better one yourself. Better than one written by experts? Well, you could have made it less like a regular speech. You know, more like the way people talk. Well, people don't go to a banquet to hear people talk just the way they talk. Gee, they could hear that at home. <laughs> of course, I don't know much about banquets, All dear. right. Well, I can tell you, regular speeches, and that's a thing. And at a business dinner... Oh, well, after all, a man knows best about business dinners. Oh, yes. Of course, I'm, I'm glad you're going, but I'm still... I'm... You mean you'd rather I wouldn't go, Leonard? No, no, I want you to go, only as long as the other men's wives are going. But, uh, look, I got a chance to be chief clerk of the department if I do this thing right. I can't seem to make you understand. Why, Leonard, I do understand. And I won't discourage your standing your way anymore. I'll just remember that you're my champion and that you're doing it for both of us. <laughs> well, then... Oh, Leonard, I don't know what I'd do without you. And I do so want you to win tonight. Just think of it, you've only that man Baker to beat, and I'm sure his speech can't be half as good as yours. No. Well, are you ready? For what, dear? Well, to hear it, of course. Oh, again? Well, gee, you want to help me, don't you? Gee whiz. Oh, oh of course, dear, of course, I'm ready. Well, here, you hold here, the notes. Now right. sit over there. Go on. All right. <clears throat> Hon honored President, Mr. Toastmaster, ladies and gentlemen... I am feeling at this minute exactly like the seasick passenger on the ocean liner who was asked... Oh, I wouldn't do that, Leonard. Um, what? I what? wouldn't hold your stomach like that as if you were seasick, too. <laughs> well, gee, that's on a gesture. I know, darling, but you know it's an after-dinner speech. Well, all right. <laughs> gee. Ex exactly like the seasick passenger on the ocean liner who was asked by a fellow passenger who was amused at his illness, are you afraid you're going to die? No, said the sick man, I'm afraid I'm not going to. And then I wait while they laugh. Yes. 
That's good, huh? Yes. Leonard, you know, I thought if you could think of one of your own, maybe... Yeah? Oh, so how about the one about the old maid and the hotel clerk? You know, huh? when the old maid comes in and she oh, says... Oh, I, I guess the other one's all right, Leonard. Never mind. <laughs> well, Jim, what, what did you stop me for? I'm sorry. Go on. All right. Here, here I go now. <clears throat> As an orator, I am non-est. However... I know what it is. I was just thinking that that non-est business, that's pretty good, huh? I mean, it's the sort of a thing that a, a man without any background would never get. You better hurry, dear. Yeah. However, I have a slight advantage on the man in the story in that I can make my remarks brief. Good night. There's a pause there. I wouldn't make it too long. Well, gee, the book says so. All right, dear, all right. Uh, go ahead. All right. Uh, tonight is a big night to me in every way. Oh, Leonard. Huh? D well, do you think you ought to hit the table like that when you say that? No. Elsie, please, the book says that when oh, I... Oh, I'm sorry, dear. Go on. All go right. on. Oh, God. I'll answer it, dear. You go on with your practice, yeah. uh, Tonight is a big night for me in every hi, way. Hi, Elsie. Hello, Chester. And well, I feel hi, Elaine. very humble How's and the very business? proud, and I thank you very much indeed. Hello, Chester. Hi. Leonard, I've got to start getting dressed. Now, do hurry, dear. Okay. Say, Chester, you didn't see the evening paper outside, did you? No. Why? Oh, I just thought there might be a list of the guests in it. I am feeling at this minute exactly like the seasick passenger. Yeah, what's huh? the matter, Len? Huh? Something you, you ate? No, that's my speech. Oh. Like the seasick passenger on the ocean liner who was asked by a fellow passenger, are you afraid you are going to die? No, said the sick man. I'm afraid I'm going to live. Are you pulling that one? What's the matter with it? It's corny. Ah, uh, what do you mean, corny? Okay, okay, take it easy. Oh, Leonard, you've got to get ready. Yeah, just a second, Elsie. Of course, that newspaper would be late tonight. Oh, listen, if you want a paper so bad, I'll go out and get one for you. Oh, would you, Chester? Oh, sure. I'll be back in two minutes. Thanks, Chester. Now, Leonard, you can get dressed while he's gone. I'll call for a taxi. Okay, Elsie. Elsie, I'm getting sort of nervous. Leonard. Huh? Well, there's nothing to be nervous about. Well, you know your speech very well, and besides, I'm right there beside you. And, Leonard. What? If you don't get it, you won't worry, will you? I'll love you just the same, always. I will, you too, Elsie. And if something does go wrong and you don't get it... Well, we'll get down to Florida and make a lot of money. Yes. Paper! There's the paper. I gotta see what it says. Now, Leonard, let me look for it while you get dressed, will you? Here, it ought to oh, be in the dear. second section somewhere. <laughs> let me see it No, now. no, no. Here it is, here it is. Right under the advertisement. John Kincaid's son's... 97th anniversary. Among those present, Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. George. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Leonard Hamilton Beebe. Oh, Leonard. <laughs> there oh. you are. Mr. and Mrs. Leonard Hamilton Beebe. What do you think of that? Oh, huh? I'm proud of Gee, you. Gee, we ought to get a lot of copies of this. Huh, oh. oh, Elsie. Well, what's the matter, Leonard? It's the grapefruit. The it's, grapefruit? It's no good. What? Listen, public loses ten million in land swindle. Worthless farms sold through advertisement as fertile soil. Promoters arrested. Oh, Elsie. Give me that. Francis D. Stevens. That was the man's name, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, darling. Gee, worthless. The thing we were counting oh, on. Oh, Leonard. Leonard, listen. You know I love you and believe in you. Now, look, Leonard, this thing doesn't matter. When, when, when you've had your promotion and you're making a lot of money, well, you won't even think anything about it. Of course, it's a disappointment at first, but everybody has those. I don't care who it is. And no matter what happens, we have each other. Leonard, take me in your arms. That's right. Now, kiss me. And remember that no matter what happens tonight, whether you win or lose... It makes no real difference to me. I'm... I'll win. Of course you will. Of course you will. Well, we'll be there in a minute now. Go ahead, darling. I feel exactly like the seasick passenger who... On the ocean liner? The seasick passenger <laughs> on the ocean liner who... who... Elsie. What, dear? You know something? I do feel like that passenger. <laughs> Seriously, 
seriously, though. Seriously, ladies and gentlemen, I am glad to announce that that moment is now at hand when our employees, particularly those who have been with us for some years, are to be recognized. Every man who's been with the company five years or more will be entitled to wear a button. A solid silver button, which is to be known as the Kincaid Service Button, with one gold stripe for each five years of service. The expense of the buttons will, of course, be borne entirely by the company. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kincaid. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as most of you know, it is the custom at each of our organization dinners to invite new blood to be present. Tonight, we have two new junior members. Leonard, Leonard do you speak now? No, I, I don't think so. Baker's first by right of seniority. Oh, you see, he joined the company a week before I did. Gee, I wonder what kind of a speech he's going to make. Oh, 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 don't you worry, darling. Yours will be better. <laughs> sure it will. It's got to be. And so I take great pleasure in presenting Mr. Thomas Wood Baker. Chap Baker. Honored President, Mr. Toastmaster, ladies and gentlemen, and guests. I am feeling at this minute exactly like the seasick passenger on an ocean liner who was asked by a fellow passenger who was amused at his illness, are you afraid you're going to die? No, said the sick man, I am afraid I am not going to. As an orator, I am not... Leonard, be quiet. What am I going to do? That's my speech. He must have used the same book I used. Oh, Leonard, you you just have to think of something else. I can't. I can't think of anything. My mind's a blank. Leonard, pull yourself together. You've got to say something. No, I want to go home. No, no. Oh, we'll sneak out the back door, Elsie, please. No, Leonard, no, we're not going to leave here. Now you can't I leave here. No, Elsie. Elsie, I'm sunk. I'm, I'm sunk. 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 I'm and now I'm going to ask the second member of the younger generation to say a few words. A young man of great promise. Ladies and gentlemen, I take pleasure in introducing Mr. Leonard Hamilton Beebe. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Miss, Mr. Beebe and I have prepared a little surprise for you tonight. <clears throat> uh, just about the middle of the afternoon. This very afternoon it was. Uh, Leonard suddenly got laryngitis. He does it uh, once in a while. And it was all he could do to speak above a whisper. Uh, he was he's feeling a little better when he got here, but he was afraid he wouldn't be able to be heard if he spoke himself. And uh, so he gave me the list of what he was going to say. Didn't you, dear? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, dear, I did. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind, I'll deliver Mr. Beepy's speech just the way he was going to deliver it. Do you mind? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Beebe wants me to say that what he was going to talk about was... was sanity. He... he refers to a spirit that's coming back into the business world after having been gone for a long time. A spirit we've got to recognize and hold on to. I mean... I mean, he means that after a good many years of... of, of dilly-dallying and, and theorizing about how to get a little humanity into business... Today, we're actually just going ahead and getting it there instead. <laughs> it, 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 it seems to me that about everybody in the world has written a book or designed a chart that'll show you how to strengthen character by mathematics or get a personality by mail or make friendships according to science. <laughs> a good many people have apparently been trying to find human nature all laid out and classified in textbooks and on maps. <laughs> now, Mr. Beebe knows he's pretty young. But he's been able to observe that these theories are wrong. He's been able to observe that a businessman, a big businessman like Mr. Kincaid, can be just as simple and human in the way he runs his business and selects his employees as anybody, and he doesn't need to lose anything by it. The, the, trouble, the trouble with most businessmen today is that they're too busy looking for some kind of a machine that'll attend to business for them. Now, John Kincaid has shown you how to get away from all that. He's shown you that there are still such things as 
understanding in business and that simple, maybe old-fashioned ways of doing things are just as efficient and maybe a little more so than all your psychology and your applied what-do-you-call-it and things like that. <laughs> now, why don't you follow this example? Go in for business. Go in for it all you want to. But for heaven's sakes, try to be a little bit human. That, that's about what you wanted me to say, wasn't it, dear? Approximately, yes. <laughs> After a short intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Helen Hayes and Otto Kruger in the third act of To the Ladies. While we're waiting, here's more news about the six beautiful Allure teaspoons which the makers of Lux Flakes are offering you right now in cooperation with the International Silver Company, the world's largest silversmiths. It's such a magnificent bargain. Only 50 cents and the top from a large-sized box of Lux for all six spoons. And they're the famous original Rogers silver plate. Everyone who sees this silver is delighted with it. For example, here is what Mrs. Marion Beaver of Dallas, Texas writes. The allure design is absolutely lovely. And I know the quality of original Rogers silver plate is just about tops. I showed my spoons to some friends this afternoon. And now they're sending for sets too. And this is what a young bride writes. We're both delighted with the beautiful allure teaspoons. We can't afford to spend much on a set of silver, but the allure pattern is such a wonderful bargain, we're planning to complete the set from the list which came with the spoons. Remember, this design is exclusive with us. You can't buy it at any store. So send for your six teaspoons now while the offer lasts. Buy the thrifty big box of Lux Flakes tomorrow. Tear off the top and mail it with 50 cents in coin. Please don't send stamps. And your name and address to Lux, Meriden, that's M-E-R-I-D-E-N, Lux, Meriden, Connecticut. You'll receive your six teaspoons promptly, together with a complete list of all the other pieces available in the allure pattern. This list includes the smart new viand knife and fork, with shorter blades and prongs and longer handles, which are so tremendously popular right now. They're so beautiful, I know you'll want to send for them, too. The list tells you how. So send for your six Allure teaspoons tomorrow. Mail the large box top with your name and address and 50 cents in coin to Lux, Meriden, M-E-R-I-D-E-N, Lux, Meriden, Connecticut. This offer is good only in the United States. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on the third act of To the Ladies. The days pass slowly as Leonard and Elsie wait anxiously to hear the results of the banquet speech. But Mr. Kincaid, the sphinx of the piano business, is silent. Then at last, Leonard is summoned to Mr. Kincaid's office. That evening, he rushes home to Elsie, a slightly dazed but very happy man. Elsie! Elsie! Leonard, is that you? Elsie, I've got it. I've got it. Leonard, what? The job, I got it. I got Mr. Kincaid's office all afternoon. Darling, you mean you're the chief clerk? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm Kincaid's Look, assistant. Look, Leonard, sit down now. Huh? You know what you're saying, dear. Yeah, I'm trying to tell you. I'm I'm Mr. Kincaid's secretary. I got a big business office I, right outside his. I'm... Gee, I, I'm an executive. An executive? Oh, Leonard. Oh, Elsie, I can't believe it yet. Gee, to think that I I did this all on my own. <laughs> I did too, didn't I, huh? You certainly did. Oh, darling, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> now, let's see. Uh, where, where was I, Miss Fletcher? Memo to Mr. Tillerson, Ray Mailing Department. Ah, yes. Now, take this, please. 
Mr. Toohey now has 12 girls in the mailing department, but believes with me that men not only could do the work better, but much more quickly than women. Uh, paragraph there. And uh, as you know, we believe, as a general rule, women are not so capable as men in business. Signed, L.H. Baby. Uh, <clears throat> now, let's see. Uh, uh, that's all. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Miss Fletcher. Yes, sir. Uh, you were going to remind me that I have a conference at 3 o'clock. Yes, sir. I will. Well, uh, I'll remind you of it again. Come in. Oh, oh, come in, Elsie. Hello, Leonard. I'll uh, be with you in a minute, dear. Yes, dear. Just take a seat, there. Oh, Leonard, it's awfully nice. No, just an office, just an office. <clears throat> uh, uh, Miss Fletcher, I'll have some more dictation for you later. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Ha, Miss Fletcher is my secretary. Leonard, it's all just wonderful. You like it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you look too cute for anything. Huh? <laughs> oh, Leonard, I knew you'd do it, and you have. Well, I, I didn't do it all, and you helped. Oh, I did not, Leonard, Oh, yes, baby. you did. You helped a lot. Oh, Leonard. I couldn't have done it without you. Oh, you could, too, darling. I couldn't. Uh, well, let's... we say we just... we did it together, huh? Together? Yeah, just you and I. And that we'll always be partners together and... Help each other. And you'll go on up and up. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be a partner someday. Oh, hello, Elsie. Hello, Chester. Are you in this office, too? Isn't that nice? He isn't in here. Oh. Say, Len, that, uh, that new efficiency fellow, what's his name? Mr. Bensley? Yes, Bensley. Well, he wants everybody to fill out another one of these slips. Home address, telephone number, and favorite sport, if any. All right, just uh, leave it on the desk. Uh, now, let me see. <clears throat> uh, Elsie, it's going to be about ten minutes before I can go to lunch. Uh, would you mind uh, waiting downstairs for me? Oh, no, of course not, dear. Oh, I... I really didn't think you'd be so early, dear. Oh, it's all uh, right, really. Have... I'll see you downstairs, Leonard. All right, dear. Say, uh, where's Miss Fletcher? I've got to give her one of these. Uh, she'll be right back. Hiya, Baker. Hello. Mr. Kincaid in? What? Is Mr. Kincaid in? What do you want to see him about? Is he in? You've got to tell me your business. Who said so? I did. See that light? He's in conference. It's about the new Rio de Janeiro representative, and it's important. So you can just wait. Listen, I want to see the boss. You can't order me around like a... No, like just a... a minute, Baker. Who do you think you are, anyway? You think you can get away with murder all because you wrote a speech. And even then, you had to have your wife say it for you. Oh, yeah, that's your story. If you ask me, it wasn't much of a speech, either. Is that so? I think it was rotten. Hey, now listen here, Baker. Chester, you keep out of this. And let him say it was a bum speech, I will not. Now listen, Baker. Chester, you don't know what you're talking about. I thought it was good. What do you know about that? Well, it was Chester, for the love of Mike, will you... You didn't even hear it. Is that so? Well, I heard him rehearsing it. No, you didn't. I never made that speech. You, you never heard me at all. I did so. You did not. I did so. I remember it myself about the seasick passenger. That one you got out of the book. What seasick passenger? I tell you, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I threw the speech away. What else did he say? Something about how he was non est as a speech maker? You know, John, well, he did. Say, what are you trying to do? I didn't say anything of the kind that was all thrown away, and if you say it wasn't, I'll oh, bet. Oh, I'm on. You had to have your wife save you. Went and got promoted on something his wife did. I tell you, it's a lie. I never was going to make that speech. I wrote a whole new one. You did not. You were going to make my speech, only I made it first, and your wife had to save you. Laryngitis. I said, don't you know, that's my right one on the square. May I inquire what this is all about? Oh, Mr. Kincaid. Well, you see, Mr. Kincaid, he wanted to. I'll tell you, Mr. Kincaid. BB never wrote that speech his wife made at the banquet, the one you promoted him for. He didn't have a thing to do with it. He wasn't able to make one himself, so he got his wife to do it for him. You may go, Baker. Yes, sir. You too, please. Huh? Me? Oh, sure. Well, I'll, I'll take it. Oh, I'll take it myself. Hello? Oh, you mean about the Rio appointment? No, I haven't made up my mind yet. Maybe Mr. Fernandez. I'll let you know. Phoebe? Yes, yes, sir? I hope, of course, that Mr. Baker was mistaken, but I shall expect you to tell me the truth. You did write the speech that Mrs. Beebe delivered at the dinner, didn't you? Beebe, this is a very serious matter. Am I to understand that you have been deceiving us? Well, it, well, it, wasn't, it, well, it wasn't exactly that way. You see how it did came up. Did you or did I'm, you not I'm... write that speech? No, sir. Your wife did it all? Yes, sir. Baby, this is regrettable, but my duty is clear. From the beginning, it was that little speech. Perhaps I should say the spirit of fellowship behind it that interested me. But my organization must be made up of men of initiative. 
and for one of my personal staff to be in any sense molded or controlled by his wife. I can't look upon that with much favor. Oh, honestly, Mr. Beginning Kincaid, tomorrow, you will resume your former position at the old salary. Oh. Great floor, going up. Leonard, here I am. Can we go to lunch now, dear? Elsie, I came down to tell you... Leonard, what's the matter with you? Nothing that you can help. Leonard... I'm not his secretary any longer. I'm going back to the old job. What? Oh, he, uh, Mr. Kincaid, he found out about, you know, the speech. Oh, Leonard. You know. Oh, Leonard. Oh, Elsie. Don't you care, dear? You know I'm standing beside you, don't you? Yes. You're standing beside a clerk. Oh, Leonard. Kincaid was right. That's all I am. Even if I had gone right up the ladder, everybody thought I was a big success. I'd know they were all being fooled. Underneath it all, I'd still be just an ordinary, everyday clerk. Oh, Leonard, you mustn't say that. I'm sure you'll get that job back again. Now, you're not to worry. We're not worry. We are when he just... No, no, let me talk to Mr. Kincaid. Maybe he'll change his mind. Oh, oh Delcy, you well, mustn't, you, please. You know, he might. You can't lose anything by it, No. Leonard. Leonard. Now, you wait right no. here while I go... Oh, no, no, Elsie, no, please, wait. Elsie. No, Very extraordinary. I don't see what Mr. Kincaid, got... please listen to me. Uh, you've demoted Leonard because I... Well, because I helped him a little bit. Mrs. Beebe, my experience has shown that the man who would be likely to require uh, assistance such as you gave your husband is not the kind of man whom it is wise to advance to an executive position. But if a wife sees a chance to help a husband, don't you think he'd want her to do it? Well, that depends. Now, suppose Mrs. Kincaid had a chance to help you in business. I I'm just using this as an example, you know. But... Suppose she was able to do something real for you, accidentally. Wouldn't you let her? Uh, Mrs. Beebe, it is one of my characteristics to act promptly and with decision. Now, will you pardon me? Mr. Kincaid, if... Hello, dear. Oh, uh, Myrtle, come in. Oh, Mrs. Beebe, how do you do? How do you do? Mr. Kincaid, would you mind repeating that to Mrs. Kincaid, what you've just been saying to me? What's that? I'm afraid I have some important work that can't... Uh, just wait. a second, John. What is it, Mrs. Beebe? Mr. Kincaid thinks that if a husband is helped in business by his wife, that he won't ever amount to anything. What? He's made Leonard a clerk again on account of the speech. Really? Myrtle, I can't stay here and listen to all oh, this. pardon me. How are you, Mrs. Kincaid? How do you do, Mr. Henry? Uh, Mr. Kincaid, there's a man here from the piano world. Have you made up your mind yet about the Rio appointment? Well, um, I haven't quite. Uh, if you'll ask him to wait ten minutes. Well, I I'm afraid it'll be too late. Oh, while I think of it, dear, I forgot to order that book I wanted. Will you do it? Why, uh, uh, certainly, my dear. Henry G., I guess there's no use waiting any further. We'll go ahead with the appointment of Mr. Fernandez. Fine, I'll see to everything. Well, I'm glad that's off my mind. Now, John, to get back to Mr. B.B., you've demoted him because you've learned it was Mrs. B.B.'s speech. I certainly have. Have you known it all the time? In a way, yes. Oh, uh... Myrtle, will you step into the other office with me? There are several things I'd like to talk over. You mean about the appointment of Mr. Fernandez? Myrtle! It's all right, dear. Mrs. Beebe understands. How's that? Oh, yes. You see, I've known about the Rio appointment all along. Is that, uh, is that so? Yes, so that when Mrs. Kincaid said she'd forgotten a book, I knew that Mr. Fernandez was, was all right. <laughs> Just as when she forgot her bag at our house and you invited Leonard to the banquet, remember? <laughs> I thought perhaps it was a signal then. Well, uh... uh... This is all quite beside the point. I uh, should say, John, that it was much to the point. Oh, I didn't mean to let on that I knew Mr. Kincaid. I hoped I could get you to reinstate Leonard without it. Uh, uh, I, I don't see how this particularly alters the situation, Mrs. Beebe. It so happens that Mrs. Kincaid is uh, rather a good judge of men and women. I sometimes use her judgment merely to supplement my own, you understand. But uh, ours is a peculiar case. Oh, so's ours. Oh, Mr. Kincaid, if you only knew it, why, nearly all the men you meet are just like you and Leonard. They don't let you know it, of course, and I suppose sometimes they don't even know it themselves. But somewhere in back there's somebody, a wife or somebody, who's helping them all the time, either giving them encouragement or perhaps doing real things like Mrs. Kincaid. Well, nearly every man that ever got any place has been married, and that just can't be a coincidence. Well, uh, uh, what do you think of all this, Myrtle? Well, suppose we have Mr. Beebe come in. I'm sure things could be arranged. Very well. I, I, 
I'll ring for him. Thank you, John. Oh, I'm so grateful, Mrs. Kincaid. Now, just a minute. I'm not bound to abide by Mrs. Kincaid's decision. No, but you always do. On the contrary, I do not. I certainly do not, and in this case... In this I... case, dear, you will. Yes, dear. <laughs> Did you ring for me? Come in, Bebe. Uh, yes, sir. Bebe, I have felt from the beginning that you were a valuable man. Huh? This... This was all just, uh, <laughs> just a test. Well, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I have what... always intended that the position in here should be yours permanently. Oh, yes, <laughs> sir, but I'm, I'm sure that I've... Elsie, you It's want... all right, dear, it's all right. Phoebe, uh, suppose we step inside and talk it over. Yes, sir. But, well, there's, there's something I want to say first. Yes, Leonard? Elsie, this was all you're doing... And I want Mr. Kincaid to know it. Why, no, it wasn't, Leonard. Yes, it was. But things are going to be different from now on. I'm going to make them different. Uh, if you'll help. <laughs> but you may not need me. Oh, yes, I will. Always. Coming, B.B.? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, I'll be late tonight, Elsie. <laughs> All right, dear. Uh, Mrs. B.B., I, uh... <laughs> I hope that any information about uh, things that you may have picked up uh, won't go any further. <laughs> no, indeed, of course not. Thank you. Not unless... Yes, yes, I understand. <laughs> oh, oh, Myrtle, you darling, you were great. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty easy, Elsie. Oh, but I've got to run along. Mrs. Fernandez is waiting for me. Oh, We've been shopping all morning. Some new clothes for Rio de Janeiro. Oh. You know, you were quite right about her, Elsie. You know, I thought you'd like her. Yes, I think Mr. Fernandez will be very successful down there. She is such an able woman. Oh, won't you have lunch with us? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't today. I'm having lunch with Leonard. But I'll see you Tuesday, Myrtle, as usual. <laughs> just a moment, Mr. DeMille brings our stars back for their curtain calls. But first, listen. Last call. Last call. Last call. That's a warning, ladies, that this is the last time we can tell you about the great bargain offer we have for you. The six handsome Allure teaspoons in original Roger silver plate for only 50 cents and the top from a large box of Lux Flakes. That's about nine cents a spoon, a value you run across once in a blue moon. It's too good to miss. So take down these directions now. First of all, buy a thrifty large-sized box of Lux tomorrow. At the same time, ask your dealer for the handy order blank. Or just send your name and address on a piece of paper and the top from a large-sized box of Lux with 50 cents in coin, no stamps, please, to Lux, Meriden, M-E-R-I-D-E-N, Lux, Meriden, Connecticut. Every piece is so exquisite, you'll treasure it always. And remember, this silver is guaranteed original Rogers silver plate. In fact, a written guarantee comes with the silver, which says in part, Every piece of silverware bearing the name William Rogers Manufacturing Company is guaranteed to give satisfaction in family use and will be replaced without charge at any time it does not conform to this guarantee. Beauty, service, and a wonderful bargain. That's what you get in these spoons. A list of all the pieces available in the exclusive Allure pattern comes with the spoons. Now, you can get as many sets as you like, but for each set, send another 50 cents and another large box top with your name and address to Lux Meriden, that's M-E-R-I-D-E-N, Lux, Meriden, Connecticut. Now, don't put this off. Do it tomorrow. Sorry, this offer is good only in the United States. And now Mr. DeMille is bringing our stars to the microphone. It's been two years, and that's much too long since Helen Hayes took her last curtain call in the Lux Radio Theater. But all is forgiven as she returns now with Otto Kruger. Oh, thank you, Mr. DeMille. I enjoyed being here so much. You know, whenever we take a play on tour, the audience in each city seems like a group of old friends. 
It takes months to see them all, and yet here in the Lux Radio Theater, we meet them all in one night. <laughs> well, Helen, we all know how these audiences feel about you. But as for myself, it's been a great pleasure being with you in the play again. I hope your next reunion will be here. Which reminds me that along toward the end of each theatrical season, there's one thing that everybody wants to know about Helen Hayes. <laughs> C.B., I'm going to take the words right out of your mouth. What are you going to do next season, Helen? <laughs> I'm playing Shakespeare for the first time, Otto. The Theater Guild's production of Twelfth Night in New York. We open in, in October, I mean. <laughs> and we'll keep an eye open for another play that will bring you back here. Oh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> DeMille, and good night. Good night, C.B. Good night. Good night. And a parting toast <laughs> to the ladies. Tonight in the Lux Radio Theater, we ring down the curtain on another season. And we're going to lift eight weeks out of the calendar for a breathing spell and prepare for another year of the finest plays and players in the land. Our footlights won't be dark long. They'll be up again brighter than ever on September 9th. But even for that short time, we're going to miss these Monday evenings. We're going to miss the excitement of the last dress rehearsal, of the call boy's rap on the dressing room door, his tense voice calling... Five minutes, five minutes. Then the silent flash that says we're on the air. And the music and the applause. Applause that echoes your applause in millions of homes. Most of all, we're going to miss you. And we sincerely hope that you'll miss us. During this past season, you've been a generous and, and I hope, a happy audience. The kind that actors love to play to. And we'll keep on working for the approval you express to us in your letters and by your loyalty to our product, Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap. The millions of you who sit in front every Monday night, row after row from Hollywood to the farthest corners of America, have made this a truly national theater, a theater of the people, for the people, and, and actually by the people. For you are the real producers of all our plays. Now our country is passing through times that call for serious thought. More than ever, the American people need unity, need their traditional unity of a single family. And I believe this national theater is living proof that unity is an American characteristic. Millions of people sharing the same program, expressing the same likes and dislikes. During the past six years, the Lux Radio Theater has presented almost 300 plays that combined the efforts of 6,367 actors and actresses and a permanent backstage staff of more than 30 people. And we are proud of the enthusiastic support you've given us by your purchase of Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap. Long before we return to the air in September, we'll be busy making plans for what we firmly believe will be the best season that we've ever had, the seventh season in this theater. Now, to all our listeners, wherever you may be, our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap, join me in wishing you a happy summer. And until September 9th, this is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night and goodbye to you from Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Arthur Q. Bryan as Kincaid, Edward Marr as Chester, Gloria Holden as Mrs. Kincaid, Tristram Coffin as Baker, Lou Merrill as Toastmaster, Stanley Farrar and Wally Mayer as Truckman, and Ann Tobin as Miss Fletcher. And here's news about two new radio programs from our sponsor, which go on the air next Wednesday evening, a solid hour of fun over the Columbia Network. The first half hour will be the air debut of Meet Mr. Meek. The second half hour, Uncle Jim's Question B. Now, if you're thinking about vacations, don't miss the first Mr. Meek program. It's an hilarious story of his own vacation, which his domineering wife, Agatha, and his worthless brother-in-law, Louie, tried to plan for him. So, meet Mr. Meek and stay tuned in for the sensational Uncle Jim's Question B next Wednesday evening. See your local paper or radio magazine for time and stations. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.